I'm really pleased to be able to introduce you. Uh, as Pastor Ken, you arrived in United Kingdom uh, in Scotland. Uh, and I believe that the, the whole adventure for you and your family started when you came to Scotland on a vacation trip. Is that right? Yeah. That's correct. Uh, I was pastoring a small church here in the Dallas, Texas area. We'd been there for 11 years and they treated me with a anywhere in the world wow. a vacation. Pick mm -hmm. your spot. It's a good way to get rid of their minister, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that was their strategy all along. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I chose Scotland and mm -hmm. uh, that was my choice. I think my wife, Jeannie, she kind of went along uh, just for the ride. But that was my choice, and that was uh, spring of 1997. Well, I had never been out of America. I, mm. David, I hadn't even been to Mexico. <laughs> and so, if you're in Texas and you haven't been to Mexico... Yeah, you haven't traveled. Yeah. You haven't traveled very much. So we headed off to Scotland for yeah. 10 days. Oh, ever dead Grave man's yards. tombstone, graveyards, <laughs> churches. And then he was so shocked by the exchange rate and you know how much less we got for the money. Yeah. I remember him telling me, oh, by the way, <laughs> you're only gonna get to eat twice while we're here a day. I need <laughs> you to fill up at the B&B &B, yeah. and then we'll eat at night. So went back to Texas after the holiday was over, kind of just you know folded it up and put it in my pocket and, yeah. and slept on it and thought about it. But it was kind of like uh, the Lord placed a tiny seed in my heart. Mm that did not die, but began to grow and grow and grow. And so I continued pastoring my church for another year hmm. and realized that, you know, God's up to something. God's stirring me and loosening hmm. the roots, so to speak. And uh, anyway, that's a, that's a real long story of all the transition. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, so I resigned. I resigned my church here in Texas probably September of 1998. And then began the process of saying, "Okay, I'll go to Scotland, but God, how are you going to arrange this?" Yeah, yeah. Big, big, big process. Yeah, absolutely. And how how were uh, your wife and family about all of this? Was this like a complete shock to them, or? Well, no. Yeah, it was a shock. It was a big, big shock to my wife. Mm. Uh, she absolutely hated the idea. Um, she did not enjoy Scotland. She was not in love with Scottish theologians. Uh, part of that was due to the itinerary that I set during our holiday. Did you did you share that captivation or? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely yeah. not, David. <laughs> that trip was. I told him the trip from hell to me. So when we got on the plane to come home. He knew it had not been good for me. <laughs> and yeah. He reached over to pat my leg and said, well, uh, was, it, it, it's, was it okay? And I said, don't you touch me. I said, this was the trip from hell. Yeah. I will never, ever come back to Scotland as long as I live. Do you understand me? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, when we got home, of course, he really felt called, let, mm. you know, because he saw so many churches that were closing. Yeah, I think at that time, 1,500 a year in the UK were closing, yeah. and they were turning them into rock climbing facilities, nightclubs, flats. Mm. You know, you know what they yeah. do, David. Yeah. They they Cop turn them into all those things. And uh, we got home, and he decided that he felt like he was called to Scotland. And as most husbands do, they want you to be on board with them. Yeah, of course. Right then and there, yeah. like, yeah. hey. I need you to be just as enthusiastic as I am. And I'm thinking, oh, oh, no, 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 trip from hell. Never yeah. going to do that. And so the Lord told him, I remember getting on the piano bench right in front of a chair, mm. and I looked at him. And I was very serious, David. Mm. I was on the bench, and I looked at him, and I got really close. And I said, I need you to understand something. I want to make myself real clear. I am never, ever going to Scotland. Do you understand me? This dream, yeah. whatever this is you have, you need to let it die right now mm. because I'm never going to go to Scotland. Mm -hmm. And he said at that point, God told him, you need to leave her alone. Don't yeah. strong harm her. Mm. Let me speak to her. <laughs> and so that is, he got really quiet mm. and I began to just seek the Lord and I would be at work and I would start thinking about castles in Scotland. I'm like, why mm. am I thinking about that? This is weird. Okay. And, and it wouldn't leave me. 
Hmm. And then I went to church one Sunday, and of course, in the Assemblies of God in America, we had something called the Pentecostal Evangel. Yeah. And I went to open it. I was in the nursery, and I went to open it and read it. There, there were castles there, and it uh, looked like Scotland. Yeah. And I started to cry. And it was like, okay, God, all right, I'm hearing you. Yeah, but that was attention. probably two or three, two or three months of mm. just Ken being silent and letting God deal with me. Yeah. So as I understand it, but you can correct me if I've got this wrong, because uh, one of the guys in AOG was telling me about how they were involved in the process when, I think when you, I'm not sure if you'd eventually come, and then there was all conversation about whereabouts in Scotland, you know, the, right. the church would be. Did you come directly to Hamilton? No, it, there was a little back and forth, David. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the leadership team, um, uh, Andrew Smith, a yeah. guy named John Fletcher, and Alec Gillis, mm -hmm. these three guys uh, knew the lay of the land, and they kept saying, Ken, we want the Lord to lead you, speak mm -hmm. to you. Where, do, where is the Lord telling you to go? And I said, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm working under your auspices, and yeah. I want to submit to you. You guys know the lay of the land hmm. a lot better than I would. I, you know, and anyway, they gave. I said, "Give me three, and I'll pray about it." And they gave me one, and it was hmm. Hamilton. Yes, because you're. What age were your children at that stage? Oh, listen, they were elementary age. Yeah. They at that time they were probably eleven, thirteen, and fifteen hmm. at that time when yeah. he was feeling this call. And of course, my. Oh, uh, one other thing I left out in feeling all of this in my own journey, the Lord told me one day in my prayer time, he said, Jeannie, make a list of all the reasons you do not want to go to Scotland. Hmm. Oh, I, I did. I made my list. And the Lord said, now give me that list back because I'm going to over answer everything on that Come list on. if you'll obey yeah. me. Wow. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Every one of them. Yeah. And so I said, Hamilton, it is. And so when they gave me Hamilton, then I began to, you know, research South Lanarkshire Council mm -hmm. and find out, you know, that it's the seat of the county, you know, the area there. Yeah, and yeah. The population, industry, do some demographic stuff and then said, you know, when we came, when we, you know, arrived, well, Hamilton was always the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, you know, uh, they get a lot of credit as well in God's yeah perfect plan. I mean, Andrew and John Fletcher, Alex, all those guys had a lot to do with, uh, you know, identifying Hamilton. Yeah. Well, we landed in November of 2001, and I didn't plant the, or start the church until June of 2002. So mm. there's, you know, six or seven months <clears throat> yeah. where every morning I was up and down the streets of Hamilton mm. talking with people. I had interviews with South Lanarkshire officials, yeah. just asking the simple questions, what's the greatest needs mm. of this community? I did, you know, community surveys. I'd go to McDonald's, I'd sit and drink a coffee, I'd open my mouth, I'd had an mm. American accent, what are you doing here? Well, that was a jump start into yeah. a conversation that I probably had 200 times wow. with people mm. on a, at a bus stop, at a coffee shop, wherever. You know, tell me a little bit about, are you local here? Yes. Mm. Tell me a little bit how long you lived here. Do you go to church? Why not? What are the greatest needs? I had a five-question survey that, David, I probably did 500 times. Yeah. And, uh, and I pulled it all together. Some of it was very witty, you know, like, you know, what advice could you give a new pastor in yeah. Hamilton? And a lot of it was, you know, like get out of town, find a new job, <laughs> yeah. you know, just all yeah. kind of stuff yeah. that endeared, honestly, it endeared me to the people yeah. because of their sense of humor. Mm. And, uh, yeah. you know, it just, it dug me in more. No, I, I got, I got to crack these people. I got to find out <laughs> yeah. you know, what, what's the secret sauce yeah. to love on these people, mm. which led really into the formation of uh, kind of what, I felt like God was wanting to start mm. with yeah. Harvest. So when yep. you arrived in Hamilton uh, with the label, I guess, as church planter, I mean, what did you have in your heart and mind for what the church would be like? What I had in mind was what you talked about on Sunday about a life-giving church. Mm. I mean, you made that really clear on Sunday, talking about a life-giving church flowing out from Hamilton, Harvest, that's exactly what I saw, a awesome. life-giving church where the fruits of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit was there, mm. 
people's lives were being changed. I saw a life-giving church yeah. to the community. It seemed like the churches were very closed. Uh, I had one experience that I got up one morning while my family was still at the hotel. I was going to go to church, and I went to the church, and the doors were locked. They wouldn't let me in. And it was, you know, no discredit to them. It may have been their procedure or whatever, mm -hmm. but it just it felt like the Lord was saying to me, Ken, we need to open the doors. Mm -hmm. And um, and I felt like through acts of kindness, through being out in the community, yeah. we were going to throw open the doors of our church. We were going to love on people regardless of their viewpoints or whatever. And uh, and uh, then through the acts of kindness, maybe we would introduce them to an alpha course or something yeah. like that. That, and uh, I, I just felt like, David, I felt like I had a lot of barriers to overcome, mm, and the yeah. only way to do that was through just simply loving on people yeah. and being as genuine as possible. Now I know uh, ministry, particularly church planting, has its ups and downs. You know, it has its up days and its down days, but. I just wondered if there was any kind of like scriptures or prophetic words or things like that that had kind of motivated you and kept you going during your time here. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, so initially, uh, one at one trip, I was on an airplane flying from America to Glasgow, and I was listening to a message by an evangelist from Pensacola <coughs> called Steve Hill. Mm -hmm. And Steve Hill um, was giving a prophetic word, and it had nothing to do with Scotland. But while I was sitting there on the plane, mm. it was almost like I had an aha moment, and the Lord just began to stir me with, you know, Ken, I'm coming again to Scotland. Right. Wow. I'm gonna I'm gonna revisit Scotland, and yeah. I need life giving churches mm. for the harvest. Yeah. Wow. And so that was the tie-in of why we called it Harvest, because, right, you know, yeah. I my vision was, let's go there, let's plant as many life-giving churches to be able to welcome mm. a, a harvest when God begins to breathe again and yeah. stir, redig the well, so to speak. Second of all, a uh, very common scripture, Jeremiah 29, I know the plans I have for mm. you, plans to prosper. We we used to sing that over and over and over. <laughs> the people probably got sick of it, honestly. <laughs> but, I mean, mm. truth be told, you know, I wasn't singing it for their benefit. I was singing it for my own. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. because, you know, you're there, you're leading a, a service, and there's four people out there, mm. you know, and it's yeah, like... Yeah. You know, you just shut your eyes and says, I know the plans I have for you, says yeah, the yeah. Lord. And it, it was during the the lean times that you mm. would dig in to the promise, the, the faithful promises of God mm. that, you know, if you go, I'll honor your obedience. Yeah. And honestly, David, I mean that as sincerely as I possibly can. Mm. I was just obedient. Yeah. But I know in the scripture for me, that has always been in the forefront of everything that we've done in Scotland. It's Ephesians 3.20. Hmm. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, yeah. abundantly, above all you can ever ask or think according to the power that works in you. And also, you know, there, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.9, you know, hmm. eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered the heart of man. Yeah. All that God has prepared for those that love him. Yeah. Okay. I always keep the promises of God in front of me. Fast forward 12 years then from your departure. We're celebrating the 20th anniversary of the church uh, this weekend. And I just wondered if, you, if you're thinking back to that launch Sunday, uh, what would you have imagined Harvest to be like at 20 years? Main thrust would have been that it would continue to be a life-giving <laughs> congregation that's mm. not only reaching uh you know locally but uh, even geographically i mean yeah. south lanarkshire north lanarkshire uh, mm. you know the, all of these areas and beyond whether that would have been through other churches that we had satellite mm. or helped plant that life-giving multiplying <clears throat> was in my heart obviously mm. to, 
to find their own location and the fact yeah. that you guys are so close now of having yeah, yeah. an entry into you know the, the the property there I cannot tell you David honestly how many times I sat on the steps right numerous times I mm. sat on the steps of a derelict building you know knowing that mm. you know this young congregation needs a home they need somewhere mm. where they can put their roots down this is no this is our home it took it took a while but you know God's timing mm. is always perfect yeah but it, it brings me so much joy uh, <laughs> David to see uh, you know how you guys are flourished and mm. healthy really healthy yeah. numbers is great but healthy is yeah. it healthy and I yeah, think yeah. you know what I'm talking about oh absolutely yeah so as you, as you well know we are celebrating 20 years uh, mm -hmm. from the first service so I, I just right. wondered finally whether or not you'd have any kind of word of encouragement that you could like look down the lens and encourage the congregation mm -hmm. Well, I, when I listened to your message on Sunday, that fourth <clears throat> point you made about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that came in the book of Acts, for me, David, when we started the church, it was the most exciting thing because so many people had never been born again. Mm -hmm. And you take somebody that's never been born again that comes into a relationship with Jesus Christ. There is so much excitement in, in that relationship that they have with yeah. Jesus. And, and it goes back to you're going to transition into the city center. And I heard you say it, you know, it's not the location. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Mm. And back there at Ephesians 3.20, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. Mm. That's the Holy Spirit working in us. And if each of our us as individuals will seek God and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we will bring that presence into the building. We take it with us everywhere we go. Mm -hmm. Therefore, when we come in and you come into the new facility, the new building there on Key Street, the presence of God is going to be there yeah. because He's in you. And as we allow the Lord to shine through us, cities are affected, estates are affected, city centers are affected, based on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us, fulfilling the will of God in our lives. So actually, I would like to encourage everyone, seek God, mm -hmm. seek the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, put Him first. And when you come together, there will be such unity in that. God's presence, you know, the Bible tells us that where there is unity, there is the presence of God. Yeah. So when you all come together, there will be such unity the community cannot deny the love mm -hmm. of Christ at harvest and the unity. They'll be drawn to it. Yeah. First, first of all, I would say uh, I'm real proud of you guys. Mm. I'm real proud of you. I'm proud because you know you've gone beyond. You've gone beyond me, and uh, it's now you guys that have stuck it out. You've endured COVID and the shutting down of so many churches. There were so many churches that didn't make it, but you survived and now you're thriving under the ministry of Pastor David and Heather. And uh, uh, so I would say, you know, my hat's off. Congratulations uh, for 20 years, but not just 20 years, but congratulations on being 20 years old and remaining true to the vision of expressing the love of Christ to your city and loving your city uh, into a relationship with Christ. Some of you remember the little South Lanarkshire vest that we would wear and and on the back I put the logo because we were out on the streets because Harvest loves Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And that's still the truth. Uh, today. That's still the truth, and I believe that that's true with your leadership of Pastor David and Heather. And my admonition would be to grow in that love, uh, be willing to uh, adapt and change and try. You always remember Pastor Ken was always trying things, and many of them failed miserably, but, you know, it didn't matter. You know, I was the alternative of doing nothing was not an alternative. 
Hmm. It was, we have to try to reach new people. And I know that there's still families there in Hamilton that have yet to be impacted with the love of Christ. And uh, I know that you're going to get behind Pastor David's leadership and the new direction that God gives the leadership there for the city, um, whether it's open during the day or open at all times of the night, you know, I don't know. But God will give you guys a vision and uh, a strategy and a plan. And don't be afraid of failure. Mm. Just keep moving. Keep moving in the direction that you know God has given you, and that is love people into a real relationship with Christ. And uh, once again, I want to say to all the leadership, the elders that are there, God bless you guys. Thank you for the leadership that you have provided down through the years. It means a lot to me that you guys are carrying on the vision. So I think that would sum it up for me, David. Wow, that, that's fabulous. Thank you so much for that encouragement. And we just want to return that blessing to you. And thank you that you, because you obeyed, um, there's a church in Hamilton now yeah. that uh, I believe yeah. is thriving and is encouragingly reaching its friends and neighbours and family. Yeah. And there's much more to come. So thank you so much yeah. for all that you embraced uh, the challenges that that involved for you and I pray that God will bless you and your, your family too at uh, this special time so thank you so much for uh, giving this time to this conversation really really appreciate it wow wow wasn't that awesome and so what, what a reminder for those of you who were here and what an inspiration for those of us who have joined since and when I was past uh, chatting to Pastor Ken and Jeannie uh, over the past few months, but r leading up to now, uh, we agreed in our combined spirits, as it were, on this title for this talk, which if you put it back up there, uh, Roots and Fruit. Um, because what I really sense from the Lord, and you know, how do you follow that? Well, you follow that with another 20 years of that. That's how you follow that. One man, one woman, one family were obedient, and look at the, I mean, look round, that's the fruit. And if we multiply that in our lives, who knows where, well, God knows, but who of us would know where that's going to go? I was drawn to 2 Kings 19.30. I don't often like to take just one verse, but it's just this idea here that I'd like to just rest on just for a few minutes. And by way of inspiration, by way of challenge to myself, obviously I've challenged myself by doing this, but also all of us as we head into year 21. It's a simple verse and it says this, the kingdom of Judah will take root below and bear fruit above. And what I believe is happening here prophetically, and I declare it in front of you now, and I seek your agreement, is that in the last 20 years, Harvest Church has taken root. And now, in addition to the fruit that's already been established, we look to 20 years of fruitfulness. Can you be, be for that? That we can have more fruit now than then. Now, when you look for fruit, I've learned the hard way that you actually have to concentrate on the roots. Let me illustrate that. In our last house, it was a nice little cottage. It was built in 1792. A nice garden. And there were two trees in there uh, that were, a, they were beautiful trees, but they were a constant nuisance because you can you weren't, they were in a uh, protected zone, so we weren't allowed to cut any bits off them or anything like that. There were, it was an ash tree, which was a beautiful tall, 20 metre high ash tree. And quite near the house, doing all its damage, was a, a cracked willow tree, which was also about 20 metres high. Both protected, and so the only way that you could do anything to them was by bringing in tree surgeons, and you had to get prior permission to be able to give attention to them, which was wonderful. There were beautiful trees. So we, every year we had the tree surgeons in, and I learned over the six years that we lived there that actually in order to get fruit and to get the greenery in these lovely trees, you had to give attention to the roots. And the, the tree surgeon was telling me that, you know, we can cut as much off the top as we can. We prune, obviously, but we don't, don't go digging anywhere near the roots because that would damage the tree. Because he says, if you can imagine it, there is, is as much tree below the ground as you can see above. And there's a huge tree. It says these roots are deep in the ground 
And so if you want this tree to be fruitful, uh, when it's uh, warm weather, just every night before you go to bed, chuck a couple of bu- buckets of water in the roots of the tree. Uh, you don't need to bother about above at this moment. And the roots, if you tend, here's the phrase he used, if you tend to the roots, the fruit will come. And I believe that that is the same for us. And so as we look to the future and we declare that the church has taken root and we go into year 21, let's tend the roots for kingdom fruit 20 years from now. It's our actions that are going to make the video for the 40th anniversary. So just think about that. What would you like to happen in the next 20 years or even the next 10 or the next 5 or the next 1 year so that you, we together, we and will be what people are talking about in 20 years' time. People will be looking back, yes, and saying, Ken and Jeannie, and there it's been saved for posterity. You know, that little video will tell that story. But when we make the next video, who knows, what will be the stories of faith and strength and courage and obedience that will come from you and from me in this next season? Well, as I was thinking about it, uh, and I'm really short of time, so I'm just going to hit this very, very quickly. I've actually discovered a little mini-series of five talks. I've got five points here, five talks. So in the autumn or maybe early spring, we're going to have a series called Roots. And I'm going to tell you week by week what they're going to be. Here's the five things that there's going to be. I, I can't go into it in too much detail, but it's five scriptures, five thoughts, five ideas, five encouragements for us, for me and for you to give attention to. And as I go through and you hear each of these uh, things, give yourself silently a little score out of 10 for where you are. And then at Life Group this week, you can reveal your scores and pray for each other. Okay, if you... There's not a lot of love on this, is there? I can see. Okay, sometimes you think you've got a good idea and it's not, <laughs> it's not really working, but at Life Group. So here are five kind of root branches, if you like, root you know, branches of the roots that will bless this church and bring kingdom fruit. So kingdom fruit, number one, comes from the root of trusting God. Trusting God. In Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8, you read this. Blessed is the man or the person, woman too, who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He or she is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream And does not fear when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Isn't that wonderful? What a wonderful picture. This kingdom fruit is the fruit that comes to us and in us when we trust God in every corner of our life. That scripture itself, and we'll come to a whole message on this, uh, uh, trust sustains life. Here is a tree, the picture is a tree planted by a source, a constant source of uh, water and food and so on. The flow of provision that never dries up. Root number one of trusting God. And that needs, each of these roots needs a response from us. For us, for me, that needs a declaration. It, means a, it needs a declaration of trust. It means it says that we don't know what's going to happen year 21 or beyond, but we can say we'll trust you, God, can't we? We can say we're going to trust you for what the future holds. Root number two, kingdom fruit comes secondly, excuse me, from being united to Jesus. As soon as I started talking about plants and all that, many of your minds would have gone to John 15, in, in which Jesus talks about the fact that we are a branch on his vine. This is the fruit that comes to us and in us when we realize the source of fruitfulness for every Christian life. John 15, 5 says this, no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me, says Jesus. I am the vine, says Jesus. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, here's a declaration, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Friends, there is no fruit, no kingdom fruit, without this life-giving relationship. As I've been thinking about this, it's clear that religion can't provide it. It's clear that doing good, even our doing good, won't produce fruit that lasts. What produces fruit that lasts is fruit that flows from a connection with Jesus. We can help people and we want to. We can help our community and we want to. We can help each other and we want to. 
But lasting help comes from connecting ourselves and other people to the source of life that is Jesus himself. This is a constant reminder to me that whatever we plan, and we've got lots of plans for the future, everything must point to that place in which someone has the opportunity to recognize the place that Jesus has in their life, even if they don't know it themselves. I'll come back to that. And this needs a decision for us to get and keep connected to Jesus, the living vine. Kingdom fruit, thirdly, comes from the indwelling Holy Spirit. We read about this, Galatians 5, 22. You know this, many of you. The fruit but the product of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And the great news is that there's no law against such things. Think of this in two dimensions. Think of it as in us, and we often do. We, we pray for each other, we pray for ourselves, don't we? That we might have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. But what about taking it up to a second dimension? And here in this church anniversary, thinking about our city and thinking, what about the fruit of the Spirit released in our city? Actually, this is a revival prayer. This is an awakening prayer. Maybe this city, well, no, maybe about it, this city needs, in addition to all the plans for regeneration and all of that that's going on, it needs a connection with the regenerator, the regenerator, the Holy Spirit of God. There's no one in this city that doesn't want Love and joy and peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control in their street. Who'd, I mean, if we went round and said we are giving that out, people would say, yes, that's the kind of place I want to live in. But we constantly have to point to the fact that it's only by the regeneration of the Holy Spirit of individuals and of communities that these qualities come. Kingdom fruit from the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Kingdom fruit number four comes from a missionary mindset. This is about us sowing into eternity. John 15 verse 8, just a few sentences on from the one I read a moment ago said this. This is to my Father's glory that you would bear much fruit. John Piper, who wrote a commentary on this whole chapter, writes this. Fruit in this chapter is a broad term and it embraces two things. Love for people and the conversion of sinners, that's his word. If you bear fruit, you love people and you win people to Christ. I was very challenged by that. Fruit that has a lasting effect is because it positions people into eternity. Dear friends, we are not city dwellers, but we are city missionaries. This area, a million people all within 20 minutes of here are city dwellers. But God's people are called not to be city dwellers, but to be city missionaries everywhere you go. And if you imagine, maybe sometime when we come to do this whole series, we'll, in, we'll interview a missionary. What are some of the things that missionaries do? Well, you heard Pastor Ken tell you, he started looking into the needs of the people. He said, why don't you do that? Where you are in your office, what's the needs of the people in my office? What's the needs of the people in my street? What's the needs of the people in a little town or whatever it is, a village or wherever I live? What can be done there for me to be able to have a missionary mindset and bear fruit for God's kingdom in that way? I just love the fact that when we have a missionary mindset and we introduce our friends and neighbors and colleagues and family to Jesus, we're sowing into eternity. We're doing something which is going to come to fruit, not only an immediate life change, which is wonderful, but for eternity. You know, it's just an amazing, amazing opportunity. And finally, kingdom fruit number five, come fifthly, as it were, comes from a life of faith. The Bible tells us that without faith, it's impossible to please God. But it also tells us that if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can say to a mountain, move, and it will be moved. We can move mountains, we can change atmospheres, we can find purpose in the plans of God. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us what faith is, and then it has a list of people who uh, were inhabited by the kind of faith that changes things. Faith is what says impossible things are now possible. Faith is what draws God to add, Heather loves this little phrase, his super to our natural Get it? So we're, we're all natural, but his super is added to our natural. 
This, friends, needs us to surrender our lives afresh to God and to say, like Pastor Ken and Jeannie did, we are up for this. Our hearts are with it. Our hands are with it. Our resources are with it. We believe that our church can reach this city and beyond by God's grace. I'm absolutely, utterly convinced of that. I'm, honestly, I, I don't need any convincing. Earlier this week, I had the opportunity to meet with some of the leaders from AOG Scotland, Assemblies of God. That's a denomination that we belong to. And we were talking and we were praying about church planting in this nation. And our heart is to see many more harvest-like churches, life-giving churches like ours, multiplied across this nation. The nation needs it. The cities need it. Hamilton needs more of churches like ours. It just does. There are, as there are, well, you know, if you do the numbers, there's 58,000 people live in Hamilton. There's maybe 120 of us here today. Obviously, there are other churches which are concluding, but even I think if we added all the churches together that are attending in Hamilton today, it's not going to be anywhere near 10% of the population or anything like that. So there's space. There's space not just on earth, but in the heavenlies for churches like ours that are bringing life and vitality across this nation. And I'm believing for it. I'm believing for it in my lifetime. But what it requires is you to join me and Pastor Ken and Jeannie, as they did, and say, I'm up for that. This is the priority of my life. There's tons of other priorities. There are loads of areas that we could put our energy into. But why not put our energy into things that are going to have eternal fruit? You see, we can put, see, I've been brought home quite sharply with this, with the death of my mother last weekend. It's like, you know, uh, uh, um, the Lord's been speaking to me out of Ecclesiastes. You know, there's a time for death and there's a time for life because yesterday our latest grandchild was born on Saturday. So we were celebrating uh, grandchild number four. So what an incredible blessing. But you can imagine the emotions that you go through when you've got a loss and a gain, as it were. But what it's really brought me up to say is that there is nothing more important than helping men and women and young people know about Jesus. Because when they get to the end of their life and you walk through their empty house, all the stuff that they have is literally going to end up in a skip or sold off somewhere. Or all of that, you know, it adds up to its value. I'm not saying there's no value to it. But the value to it is literally there today. As Ecclesiastes says, it's there today. The wind blows and it's gone tomorrow. The best place that you can invest your life, and I'm talking to myself as well, the best place you can invest your life, the best place you can invest your money, the best place you can invest your savings, the best place that you can invest your time and your energy and your prayer and all of your emotion is in kingdom fruit. Because kingdom fruit is fruit that lasts. It goes beyond an empty house. It goes beyond a life lived, however wonderful, to 120 years, I'm only with him 120 and I want to be healthy all that time. That'll be amazing, but it's a fraction of what can be done in the life of someone who enters eternity because I've invested in the life of the kingdom and, and the church. You know, everything else is important. Yes, it, they are, these are important things, but I want you to join with me in thinking hard, and it's particularly in life group and uh, whenever you have it this week, to pray hard. What could we do to invest for eternal fruit. Because I look, I long for the day when I'm 121, when I go to glory and I actually meet people. I really believe I will meet people there who were, I pray God, were influenced by my prayer, were influenced by my words with them, were influenced, influenced by a card I sent them or a sermon I preached and they watched somewhere in Timbuktu. Um, I, I believe that there'll be people there who know Jesus and are with me in glory because I invested my time, my energy, my money, do, 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 all of my resources, all my time, my treasure, my talents into something that is going to last. I pray, God, that that will be our story. I pray in 20 years when whoever's here, maybe it'll be me making a video, I mean, editing video when I'm uh, 42, will be pretty hard, okay? Uh, but, you know, you know, somebody else will be doing all of that stuff. We'll be the old codgers, but God will have done something fresh in you, I believe. So I don't know about you. I'm up for that. I'm longing for uh, God to move. And so, Father God, I just pray, would you bless this church? Yes, would you bless our aspirations? Yes. Would you bless our vision? Yes. Would you bless our plans? 
and our actions as we have set forth. Father God, we do pray, would you provide for us in every way? We thank you for that lovely building down in Keith Street there. We know that it's close, Father God. Would you provide all the resources that's required for us to get the key and get that open and become that central place in the centre of the city down by Junction 6. We trust you, God. We believe for fruit. Father God, I just want to pray for men and women and young people who will be in the empty seat next to me right now. Father God, you know the man or the woman. If you've got an empty seat around you, just look at it. Put your hand on it and just think. There's going to be somebody sat there who's going to be invited by someone in this room. Father God, I thank you in advance, in faith, for men, women, young adults, young people, and children who are going to become part of this fellowship in year 21. Would you honour us? Would you honour all the work that's gone on in the last 20 years of Ken and Jeannie and all the pastors since, all the teams since, every event that's happened in this past 20 years? Would you honour it, Father God, by giving us fruitfulness and flow in year 21 in your precious name? And we will be close and we will be quick to give you all the glory and all the honour for everything that you do in your precious name. And the congregation said... Amen. Amen.